Uh, many of you will um, have be familiar with Ernie Lepore's work. It's a great pleasure to have him with us this evening. Um, he's the Board of Governors Professor in the Philosophy Department at Rutgers. He's known internationally for his work chiefly in the philosophy of language, but also in the philosophy of mind and cognitive science. He's the author of many books and papers, including Liberating Content, and a little bit longer ago with Sarah Jane Leslie, What Every Student Should Know, and also many collections uh, which he's edited, including the Oxford Handbook of the Philosophy of Language um, with Barry Smith. And tonight his lecture is going to be entitled Slurring Words, Slurring Articulations. Ernie, over to you. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to begin with some confessions. I'm not a public speaker, so I apologize for that in advance. And I am an analytic philosopher, which makes it even harder to become a public philosopher, a public speaker. If there's anyone I know who's out there, I can't see anybody, so I apologize for not acknowledging it. Um, the good news is that the topic of today's lecture is something that everybody in this room has a view about. And I think if, if I can make any contributions, one of the ones I want to make tonight is to say that the two sides I don't know how it's being played out in England, but in the United States, it's a raging debate of two sides. One side um, sees the other side as overly sensitive. The other side sees the other side as incredibly insensitive. And the question is, can we make any progress on that? I'm going to try to make some progress. I'm going to argue they're both making what looks to me like a common error. And if I'm right, they're not really arguing. They're, they've, missed, they're, they've, missed, they've missed the point. So let's see where we go. Uh, slurs, introduction. They're expressions. I think we all know what slurs are. So my, this is a, material is being drawn from a book that I just finished that I'm going to publish with Oxford, I hope, soon. And it's about pejorative language in general, including profanities and other kinds of bad words. But tonight I want to focus on slur terms. And I have a, several graduate students from England who tell me that I should not assume that English slur terms in England are the same thing as English slur terms in English. They said we all share the same, same one that we think is the worst word in the English language, but there are lots of words that Americans find extremely offensive that Brits don't find offensive at all. Uh, I'm not going to get into One of the things that uh, I call, talked to Una Slunchuk, my collaborator today. I said, do you have any advice? She says, yes, don't start mentioning slur terms, <laughs> whatever you do. And just don't start telling anecdotes, because when you tell your anecdotes, you want to mention slur terms. When you start mentioning slur terms, you get yourself in trouble. So just don't do anything with that stuff, not because anything like that. In fact, one of the things that she insisted upon is that the slur term we use to discuss our paper is mudblood, which apparently is in Harry Potter. I haven't read Harry Potter, so I don't know that. So we took a fictional slur term to be our paradigm. But a lot of authors, like my colleague Liz Camp, for example, will say that you don't, if you don't feel the oomph of a slur term, it's hard to understand the points that you're being made. So what I want you to do is when I say mudblood, you think to yourself, what's a, what's a nasty word that I can think of as a slur term? And you replace mudblood with that in your mind's eye. Not, don't say it out loud, please. <laughs> and, then, and see how you feel about that. And that, that should back up some of the things I'm saying about mudblood. OK, so let's see. So slur terms are expressions that target groups on the basis of race, nationality, religion, gender, sexual orientation, immigrant status, you name it. I mean, it's pretty much anything you can you know, turn into a slur term. Um, a central topic in the study of slurs is why are these uses so offensive? So why do people get so pissed off when they hear someone use a slur term? And the presumption has been forever and ever and ever. Uses of slurs are offensive because they convey negative attitudes towards targets and their content. And semantics teaches, oh, so the main, the consensus view is that uh, slur terms are bad because of what they mean. That seems like a commonsensical view. I'm not surprised that it's held so widely. I think it's crazy and utterly wrong, and I'll say why in as much detail as I can without turning this into a linguistics talk or something to that effect. Uh, uh, but it's, it is the received view. When I started writing on this stuff, I started thinking about this stuff in, ninth, in the early aughts. I had a graduate student who is now a professor at Syracuse, Lavelle Anderson. And Lavelle and I said, I said Lavelle, why don't we read something together? And he said, let's, let's read Tim Williamson on Pajar of Language. I said, the guy at Oxford? See, I said, does he even know what a profanity is or a slur term? <laughs> and he said, he's written on this. Well, sure enough, I read the article. And it's just an excuse to talk about something else. 
So when I looked at the articles on slur terms, by Dummett, for example, one by Brandom in America, they were always about something else, like inference and so on. And slur terms were used, the data from slur terms was used just to back up some philosophical view. The only paper I could find that I thought, well, this is a really useful paper about slur terms was one by Jen Hornsby that she published a long time ago on silencing. I thought it was a really impressive paper. But otherwise, I was a bit surprised. So just as a sort of autobiographical point, I was surprised with how little had been written on the topic, because it seemed like the kind of thing that just begged to be written about. And we, Lavelle and I published a paper, which was, I thought it was a book report, so to speak, of how we spent our year together. And that paper has several hundred citations. So I recommend writing on slur terms if you want to get heavily cited. Uh, it's really embarrassing. These papers I wrote with Fodor, which are classic papers in a way. Lavelle and I just ran past them. That's life. <laughs> so anyway, since semantics teaches us the ways of expression, so the idea is that if you, if you study semantics, one of, the, one of the topics of semantics is how do words acquire the meaning they have, and how do those meanings fit together? How do they play out in the, in the sentence at large or in the discourse at large? So if you know something about that, you think, well, if someone says that slur terms are bad because of what they mean, well, let's see. Let's think of the various theories of meaning we have, various expressions we have, kinds of expressions we have, and how they mean what they mean, and does slur terms look like any of them? So that sets us off on a pretty boring task, which I'm not going to spend much time on. So this is the plan book for today. Canvas and reject some meaning options. I have what I consider like a, the knockout punch. So I'd only have to give you a little taste of the first couple of meaning theories, as you'll see in a moment. Not all of them, because I have a knockout punch against any meaning theory, which I believe works. So we'll see what you, you might not think it works, we can talk about it later. Um, then reject the alternatives. So we've seen on our meaning theorists, so like Lavelle and I and I. We, we defended something we call prohibitionism. Uh, and I, well, maybe that works. I didn't argue those theories don't work either. So I'm going to argue that all the theories that I'm aware of that are in print, including ones that I put in print, are bad. They don't work. And I'm going to offer a brand new one today. Which on its face sounds cockamamie, but it's not. I'm going to give you some data that I think will defend it. OK, so the predicative account. So the obvious place to start is with predication. So you think when you say uh, John is an African American, that's not offensive. It might be. Actually, it might become offensive. I just found out recently, this is, I've got to be careful. I'm so careful. I'm so rotten with these anecdotes. But I don't think this one's bad. So I have a gay graduate student, and he told me recently that homosexual was not quite a slur term, but it was not a preferred term. And I said, well, how did that happen? What, why? He said, because it sounds medical. And I'm not sure if I follow that exactly, but it sounds like it's a diagnosis or something to that effect. Right. So these things are constantly shifting, fading in, fading out, and so on. A lot of the slur terms that I remember from my childhood, if I were to say them out loud, you know, you, many of the younger people would say, well, ah, that's not a slur term. Yeah, it is. I gave a talk. You have to be careful, though. I gave a talk at Hampshire College one time. And I used a slur term that Dummett uses in his papers. It's an old term, which I'm not going to give you. It's an old term from uh, English, or from French, I guess. Of a, of, a, of a slur term of Germans. It was after World War I. And I had never seen the text expression before. So it had no significance for me at all. And I was saying this to this large room at this talk at Hampshire College. And Angelica Kratzer, a well-known linguist, a friend of mine, was in the lecture hall. And she was almost weeping. I said, what's happened? She said, well, actually, that word means really bad things for me. My father and I went to Paris after their, their, their she's German. At the Paris after the war, and some French guy woke up and yelled at my father, called him this word, and I could see the hurt in his face. So whenever I hear that word, I think of the hurt in his face, and I decided, mud blood, that's the way to go. Now, if, if you if I break up over my blood, I apologize in advance. So let's see. So you might think it's predicative. You might say, well, the difference between African American and, and a slur term, like the N word. So when I originally started writing on the uh, slur terms, I published a couple of pieces in the New York Times on the N-word. And I got a call from the editor from the New York Times and said, uh, Ernie, you can't use the N-word in an article in the New York Times. I said, I would never use the N-word anywhere. Forgive me. He said, no, you don't understand. You cannot use the N-word. I said, I understand perfectly well, and I'm never going to use it. I swear, I promise, I'll never use it. He said, no, you don't understand what I'm saying. You cannot use the expression, the N-word. I said, what? <laughs> he said, it's too canonical. I said, what the hell does that mean? He said, what am I supposed to do then? He said, I don't know. You figure it out on your own. 
Well, I'll never forget that. We had like an Abbott Costello routine. Don't use the N-word. I would never use the N-word. No, you used it. You just used it. I said. <laughs> um, so one thing you might think, if you place American, African-American with the N-word, you might think that what makes the difference between these is that they encode different meanings. They might be coextensive. So for example, take the square root of 4 and the number 2, the numeral 2. They, they coextensive. They pick out the same thing. But they don't mean the same thing. If I say that's the square root of 4, I'm attributing something slightly different of the thing I'm talking about than if I say that's the number 2. Okay? So you might think something like that's going on with the slur terms, that they mean they overlap in extension with the sort of positive terms, what they call them, neutral counterparts. But they don't mean the same thing. They have different, they contribute to something else. There's a little bit more on the slur term. There's something bad that you're adding to the, it's just the extension. Well, the problems with this account is, this is the earliest accounts that I could tell were identified and supported, is that they're, one of the things that's sort of bizarre about this literature, which you could find it for yourself if you don't believe me, look up a slur term in the OED. In fact, look up, if you know, if you know a language that has several slur terms for the same group of individuals, look that up. What you'll find is the exact same entry. In fact, you pretty much find the exact same entry for all slur terms is, you know, uh, a pejorative expression for this group. That's the meaning. And you say, well, they can't all have the same meaning. Well, how do you know that? Well, if the meaning is what drives the offense, some of these terms are much more offensive than others, even if they're coextensive. There are some words in English that you use for a group that are way more offensive than other words you might use for the same group, even though each is, is offensive to some degree. So you need some specificity. You never get it. So one of the shocking things about the literature is if you read any professional article on the topic, nobody ever gets around to giving you the meaning. They say some Mickey Mouse thing about, oh, it's something bad, and it's something that goes like this. Is bad. So let's see, Mudblood is like, is a muggle, muggle-born wizard, I think something like that. Did I get that right? I'm impressed. Muggle-born wizard, uh, something, but it's, in virtue, it's a bad thing to be a muggle-born wizard. That's, that's it. You think, that's it? Uh, that's not supposed to get offended by? And you think, it's not enough specificity. So one of the shocking parts is that all oh, everybody's a meaning theorist. Nobody actually ever gives you the meaning. Or if they do give you the meaning, it's some highfalutin technical thing, which you think, that can't be what pisses anybody off. I mean, you'd be asleep before you got to the end of the, this, of the definition. The other thing is, some people just say, well, it's indeterminate. You think, well, that's bad. You don't want it to be indeterminate. Or why not? Well, usually when you communicate with people, you have an intention. You want to convey some information. If you can't do that, then in what sense are you communicating? I mean, if I can't tell you what I'm intending to get you to believe, then in what sense am I trying to communicate something to you? So I intend to do something, but it's indeterminate, whatever it is, so you're never going to figure it out, a, a definition, because it's indeterminate. That's a bad thing as well. Uh, but anyway, if you look at, uh, here's the third argument. The third argument is based on the behavior of, of slur terms inside other larger discourses. So if you negate, um, Hermione is a muggle-born wizard. You say, that's false, or it's not true that she's a muggle-born, or, or she's not a muggle-born wizard. You know that you're saying, take that predication and remove it. It doesn't apply to her. That's what it means. But now when you say, Hermione is a mudblood, and you deny that, she's not a mudblood, or that's false, um, it looks as though you're still being offensive. Right? When you say, she's not a mudblood, Again, pick your favorite slur term. My blood might not do it for you, but pick one that will do it for you. And you say, that's bad. I would never say that. That sort of thing. The, being, the point being that they're not doesn't say, it doesn't have the impact it should have if it were predication. If it were predication, you could withdraw the predication just by saying not. But it doesn't work that way. The not sentences are as offensive as the non-not sentences. So that tells you however the slur term's meaning, if it is its meaning, which is contributing to its offense, it's not by way of predication. It's something else. Well, a number of people saw that immediately and moved on to these presuppositional accounts. So if you look at a sentence like, John has stopped smoking, what's interesting about that sentence is if you say John has stopped smoking, I say that's false, or he has not stopped smoking. We're both in agreement. We're both backgrounded that he used to smoke. In other words, I can't deny that he stopped smoking without committing myself to him having smoked. Right? It's part of the, what it means to say it's presuppositional. So that looks like a better candidate, perhaps. You say, well, let's see, John's a mudblood. No, he's not. He's not a mudblood. Uh, if it's presupposed the content, 
that explains why I can't get away with saying not and withdraw the offense. The reason why is because it's, it sort of scopes outside. So when I say someone's presuppositional that he stopped smoking, it's already presumed that it's part of our common ground that he used to smoke, and now I'm telling you he, he stopped, and you say, no, he hasn't. So similarly, it's already part of our common ground that whatever is bad about being a mudblood, it's, a, it's, it's presumed that we know what that is exactly. And when I say he's a mudblood, you say he's not a mudblood. We're sharing the bad stuff. Right? Even if you don't want to share the bad stuff, you're sharing the bad stuff. You're complicit, at least. And therefore, this is a better candidate than the, uh, than the predication account. Well, the problem with this account is that we know that there are ways to block this presupposition. So consider the sentence like, Mary said that John used to smoke, but he never did. So that sentence does not presuppose that he used to smoke. Right? So presuppose Mary, that Mary presumes he used to smoke, but I don't have to presume it. In fact, I denied it. So when you put a... Uh, a, a presuppositional trigger like smoke, you, uh, smoked in a uh, or stopped in a uh, in a sentence, uh, you can't you you block the presupposition from from taking effect, but you don't do that with the slur term. Point being is that slur terms look like wherever you say one of them, no matter where they say it, it's bad. So if you say this, that's why we say that children don't say that. We don't say don't say that except in the negation. We don't say don't say that except in a report. Don't say, don't say that except in a, a antecedent of a condition. We say, don't say it. Don't mention it at all. So there are all these different kinds of accounts, which I'm not going to bore you with. You're happy to read my book when it comes out or some of the articles that Lavelle and I wrote on conventional implicatures, expressivist views, perspectival views, pragmatic views, all the kind of things that analytic philosophers like to waste our time on. Uh, but I'm not going to bore you with that tonight. I'm just going to say there are arguments against each of these views. But I don't need to tell you about those because I have a universal argument. I have an argument which applies to any effort. An argument that says it can't be about meaning. Why well, does that work? Well, it's my quotation argument. Take a look at this sentence. Mudblood has eight letters. I'm quoting mudblood. I'm not using it. I'm quoting it. So it's not about its meaning. It's just about, it's about those letters. If you can count the letters, you can see whether it has eight or seven or six and so on. Right? So I haven't used the term. I've mentioned the term. So, so the meaning, the way the professionals talk about this is that if you mention an expression, you render its meaning inert. The meaning is not playing any role. The meaning of the word mudblood plays no role in whether that sentence is true or false. The only thing that plays a role is the letters inside the quote marks. How many are there? Similarly, if I say to you, name a slogan term, and I say, well, mudblood's their term. I haven't used the term. I've mentioned it. Okay? But I would argue that anyone who, who tokened one of these sentences would be offensive. Again, replace it with your favorite slur term and see what you think. If it plays out with you. So I'm arguing essentially that the s quoted slur terms are offensive, maybe not as offensive anymore, depending on your view. There's actually a pretty rich psychological literature with testing how this plays out. And it turns out these are pretty offensive by, by stand local standards. So if this is right, if I'm right that quoted, quoted slur terms can be offensive, then we're done with meaning theories. Because meaning theories say, what makes a term Offensive is its meaning. Well, the meaning's not in play in any of these sentences. You get the term still offensive. You can say, well, you're reminded of the meaning or something like that. But that's not the same thing as the meaning. It's a, rem that's the, it's a reminding that's doing the work, not the meaning itself. So in other words, when you quote an expression, you remove the meaning altogether. If that's true, and if I'm also right that these sentences are offensive, and then, then what you know is no meaning theory can explain this data. Now, Tim Williamson and I have argued about this. But I think he used to like me. I don't think he likes me anymore. He calls me, he, now he calls me a woke. And I said, really? I said, can I quote you on that? You know, no one thinks I'm a woke. I'd be great if I were woke. And uh, then I said, Tim, do me a favor. I said, when you have some free time, come to New York. I'll bring you up to Harlem. And you go around mentioning the slur term. And when <laughs> people start beating the shit out of you, you say, hey, you're making a use mention confusion. I was only mentioning the expression. Those aren't supposed to be offensive. I said, they're offensive. Now, what I think is going on here is deep. So this is the first deep point I want to make. Yeah, this is the first deep point I want to make. This is a contribution, I think. So this is something new I'm going to say tonight. I think now that what's going on, why they have these crazy debates where the people say you're oversensitive, you're undersensitive, you're in insensitive, and so on, is that there's two different notions that are being conflated. One is the cause, a causal notion, and the other is an ethical notion, a moral notion, an intentional notion. So for example, 
if I punch you in the face, you can't say, I, and you say, that hurt. I can't say, it didn't hurt. It hurt. Yeah, I know, my first person authority on it, it hurt. It hurt a lot, in fact. So what I think now is that certain slur terms, when they hit us, they hit us. They're like, like punch in the face. It's like you're being slapped. You're stung. That's the expression I use. Certain slur terms sting you. Now, does that mean it was wrong or bad? Or is there, is there any way to remove blameworthiness or something? Yes, of course. If it's a child or a, I was at a conference in Italy on slur terms a couple years ago. There were maybe 20 papers, maybe 15 of them were by Italians, who don't really speak English as a native language, of course. And they don't really know English even as a second language. But they know the N-word. And they drop that N-word over and over and over. And after like 10 days, I said, stop. I can't take it anymore. I've got to get out of this room. It's driving me crazy. I was being stung. I didn't think they were doing anything bad. I didn't think they were immoral. I think that, or another example. I taught a course once in, in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia. I asked my uh, collaborators from St. Petersburg to give me a list of slur terms in Cyrillic that they could give me for Russian. I flashed on the board. The kids went nuts. They all pulled out their iPhones. And said, I've never seen these words written down before. And of course, it had no impact on me at all, none. It didn't mean anything for me. There was nothing going on. I was not stung by them. But sometimes, if you're familiar with the language, you know something about its history of usage, you are stung. And that's the bottom line. That's enough to say it's offend it offends me. Now, does that mean that you did something wrong? Well, it depends. Tell me some more about what happened. What happened? Did I punch you because you insulted my mother or punched me first or something of that effect? That might be relevant. Uh, 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 in the child's case, what do you say? Well, he didn't know better. We tell him then, don't, don't say that word anymore. Don't say that word anymore. But we don't, we, don't, we don't blame him for having done something wrong. We just think he was ignorant. Or a foreigner, for example. So in other words, I think there are issues that are moral issues. What I think is going on in this literature is that people are conflating causal issues with moral issues. And they're talking past each other. So no one could deny that some slurs sting you. And in fact, what happens usually is they didn't sting you initially. There are expressions I can think of that were neutral words in the 50s and 60s and 70s that became slur terms uh, in the 80s and 90s, and now are sort of fading away in, a, in, a, in, this, in the new millennium. And that's what happens with words. I'll come back to that later. But from that, it doesn't follow that it was right or wrong to use the terms. Those are independent issues. So I think the moral issues are downstream. First we say, this expression offends me. And then we ask, why? Why did the person use it? What was going on? Was it a play? Was, he trying to be, was it an artist trying to make a point? Maybe a theatrical point or an artistic point? Was it a, a, ped a pedagogical environment? Was the teacher trying to teach you something about their terms? You know, so one of the things that's funny to me about Liz Camp is she begins her papers almost invariably by saying, I know I'm going to offend some of you. Which her theory is basically saying, no one should be offended by a mentioned expression. But, but she says at the beginning of each lecture or each paper she writes on this topic, I apologize in advance for offending anyone who's offended by my mentioning a slur term, even though the part of her theory is that you, you can't offend anybody by mentioning a slur term. So in some sense, reality takes over and she forgets her theory, she just remembers what, what, how humans interact. And we don't like hearing slur terms, so we can help it. So that's a big point. That's a huge point, which I think is the kind of point that you'd expect to be taught in ethics in the first week of school. So, and these people are really smart, so I don't know. I don't have an explanation for why they would make this conflation, but I'm pretty confident it's being made. So, what I say here: arguments for the aptness of a slur, say in pedagogical context, reports of other speech, or within an artistic context, rely on a sting. Some tokenings can be blameless or excusable, even if saying the sting transpired. We might excuse an ignorant child or a non-native speaker, even though their tokenings are painful. So I'm, den I'm not denying that the, the, the slur terms are painful or not. Well, I'm denying it has anything to do with the meaning of the slur term. So how it came to, be how it came to have that sting is an interesting question. All the semanticists are committed to the view, the meaning theorists are committed to the view that has something to do with meaning. I think that's a crazy view, and I can't find any evidence that supports it. Prohibitionism. So you say, OK, let's drop the meaning theories. Suppose you're right. Let's drop meaning theories. What's left? I said, well, you could do what Lavelle and I do. We were prohibitionists. Basically, what happened at the end of the year, we said, none of these theories work. What should we say? Well, let's just say words are prohibited. We didn't win a lot of converts with this view, but what is the view out there? Remember, you have to, one of the things that's complicated about doing philosophy is it's hard to track the dialectic. It's easy to get lost and forget where you are. 
So we are, at this point in my paper, where generously you're going to concede to me the meaning theories don't work. Maybe you don't really believe that, or you think you have a meaning theory. I'd like to hear it. Not now, during the discussion. Uh, but give it to me now, and what's left? So Lavelle and I said, not much left. Maybe we should just say that they're taboo. The certain terms are taboo. Why they, why they became taboo is an interesting question. Probably have to talk to sociologists or historians or psychologists or somebody other than a philosopher. Someone actually knows something about the world and explain how that happened. But just the same, they, uh, they, that's what happened. What happens is somewhere along the line, these words were prohibited. They were considered taboo. They were no longer to be used. And someone, when someone breaks the prohibition, it stings, we think. That part sounds a little slippery, and I agree it is slippery. I concluded that when writing this paper. So slurs are prohibited words, and the offensive effect of a tokening one results from violating the prohibition. So basically, under the prohibitionist view, the sting is the result of you being offended that someone broke the, the, the pact, the prohibition. It's in virtue of a slur being banned that it acquires the potential to offend when token. That's the view. Nothing to do about meaning. Doesn't mention meaning at all. Uh, elaborated. Prohibitions tie the majority of effect to taboo associated with the word itself. Since prohibited words are normally prohibited everywhere they occur, prohibition explains why the offensive effect tends to remain even in case of quotation. So it's not as if you could say to the king who prohibited the word, oh, I'm just quoting it. That's not going to play out. That's not going to play at all. So if a word's prohibited, it's prohibited everywhere any, in any format. So you can't quote it. You can't report it. You can't do any of those things with it. It's just not a word you just expunge. You're supposed to expunge this from your vocabulary. So I've explained why quoted words could be uh, bad, even if the meaning's not in play, because they're words. They're there. And this, the theory just says the word should not appear anywhere. It's prohibited. It's taboo. It's illegal. It also explains why the offense transpires regardless of the intentions and attitudes of the speaker. An inadvertent violation of a taboo, even in the absence of a negative attitude or malicious intention, is still a violation of a taboo, and as such, it risks offending. So even if you have no bad intentions, it still can be offensive to others, even if you didn't intend to. I mean, imagine you live somewhere where the waves came in every night. And they sound like they were saying the N word. You know? It wasn't, they couldn't, it's waves. It's just, you know, but it sounded like that. It would annoy you. You would say, I got to move. I got to get some earplugs, something. Like that. You would not want to be happy about that. That's the, the idea, roughly. That you're not going to blame the ocean. Oh, the ocean's an evil creature. It's an evil part of the world. I imagine somebody thinks that, but you don't have to think that. Reasons for prohibition. How come words become prohibited? Well, who knows? That's not philosophers on the side. Uh, that's a decision from relevant authority. It's interesting what counts as relevant authority isn't always obvious. So um, Re Reverend Jesse Jackson, when he was running the, when the presidency under the Rainbow Coalition, he wanted to banish the word black. He thought black was a, was a slur term, essentially. And he wanted to make it a slur term. But the young people said, hey, I like that word. That's a cool word, black power, you know, black panthers, I'm black and I'm beautiful. These kinds of things resonated well with the community. So they said, we know you're rich and famous and, and so on, influential, but we don't agree with you. So someone as influential as he is would not be the relevant authority for deciding this. And the other one, there was an example where an expression for African Americans, which was the polite for form in the 50s and 60s and 70s, um, um, why was it banished? Not because it was meant something bad, because it was introduced to be a polite form. But at some point, I think it was the voice, someone who was had a conversation with a young girl, a young a black girl, and she said, we didn't choose that term. They chose that term for us. We should choose our own terms. And that was a sufficient grounds for banishing the word. They said, the relevant authority was the voice and this young woman. And they said, this expression is not one that self-determination should be decided by the individuals that the terms apply to. This happened in, in Norway not that long ago. So Norway is not famous for its open door policy. Uh, shockingly opened their doors to uh, Norwegians. Uh, the Norwegians. Yeah, so that's right, though. They opened, <laughs> they opened their doors to Somalians. And I was shocked by this myself. I had a position in Norway. There's nothing in Norway I knew. Uh, and, and then you could, you could tell how old somebody was by how they reacted to 
the expression that the Norwegians decided to call the new, entry, new immigrants to the country. They basically chose the Norwegian word black. And if you were over 50, they couldn't, you would just boggle with your imagination. Well, it's just black, it's a color. It's nothing bad, we don't have anything bad by it. If you were under 50, you said, hey, they don't want to be called black. You can't call them that. You can, it was a Norwegian word, something like that. So there's an example where it wasn't the meaning, it was just who decided, who gets to decide what, what, what I'm called, and so on. So that could be a reason as well. I've, I, I doubt I could list all the reasons why, because I doubt I have the talent or the knowledge to do so. But you can imagine all sorts of kinds of stories contributing to this. What else did I mention? Anything else? The history of usage and negative associations uh, that have risen through history that are evoked tokens. Reasons of self determination. I listed all those. Now, criticism. Alas, it doesn't work. I like it to work, but it doesn't look like it works. Why not? What's wrong with this view? Well, there's been lots of times in the history of the world where words have been banished and nobody felt like they were offended or they weren't turned into slur terms and so on. So, for example, the Russians under the Tsar banished all sorts of words like all of Polish, all of Ukrainian, all of Belarusian, all these different languages. When they took over a place, they said, no, you've got to speak Russian from now on. No more of this nonsense, this other stuff, just Russian. Um, I don't think that made, any, made all of Polish a sl you know, slur terms. Every word in Polish is a slur term. Every word in Ukrainian is a slur term. So there can be banishments with, you know, on the prohibitions on the use of terms without equipping these terms with the power to offend or sting. I don't think the Ukrainians thought were, their language was uh, full of slur terms. I don't think the Russians thought Ukraine was full of slur terms. But just the same, they were banished. So banishment can't be enough. So if the prohibitionist is the view that banishing a word, prohibiting its use, it's calling its usage taboo, is what gives it its sting, that can't be right because these are counterexamples. In fact, the general view is that Lavelle and I got this cockamamie backwards. The terms are not, terms don't become bad because they're banished. They're banished because they're bad. So the question is, why, what made them bad in the first place? Not what, what, what provoked you to banish these words? What provoked you to make these words taboo? What provoked you to prohibit these words? That should be the question. And if you say it's not meaning, what else is left? So this view was considered, I think, by many who criticized it just to be on the wrong track. Um, now, my second contribution tonight. I said I had some original things to say. This is, the first one was this conflation, which I think people learned in the first week of ethics. I think, I don't know, I didn't take that week. But uh, it looks like an obvious distinction. Uh, but I think it's one that's in play in the literature. Another one that I think is in play in the literature, and one I want to challenge tonight, is one that I kind of discovered. I was shocked that I had to discover this, because it looks like the kind of thing that should be around forever. Certainly, you think the medievals must have known about this. They, did, they knew about a lot of stuff. But no one's ever seen this before. So prohibition maintained that it's words that are subject to taboo. Content theorists, all the meaning theorists I've mentioned, they claim that the potential offense in a slurring words meaning or use, so again, it's words, all about words, uh, decide an old adage, it's words that have consequences. However, the offense effect of a slur is triggered not by the word or its meaning, but rather by some, though not all, of its articulations. So I'm drawing a distinction between an expression or a word and its articulation, how you pronounce it, how you spell it, and so on. That distinction has never been made before, as far as I know. In fact, most Peers, people on word individuation identify a word by its shape, right? which is a little weird because you know, sounds don't look, have the same shape as, as, as graphemics. So I want to first, do, first thing I want to do is make a distinction between words and articulations. This is my second contribution. And this is something which is, when I tell it to you, you're going to say, that's obvious. But as far as I know, no one's ever seen it before. So some, you can imagine a scenario where we had three people all of whom were fluent in English, completely fluent in English. They share the vocabulary, they share the productivity rules, the grammatical rules, they agreed on what sentences were grammatical, what sentences were not grammatical, and so on. But they can't communicate. Why not? Well, because one speaks English, let's suppose, but can't write it, can't sign it. One can sign English, but can't read it or write or speak it. One can write it, like Latin, for example, but can't speak it and can't sign it. So they don't share a system of articulation. They share a language, English, but they don't share any means of articulating that language in a way that's accessible to each. So right there, I drew a distinction for you between words and articulations. If you bought into that, the rest is a piece of cake for you. 
So the tokens of any given word can vary in its articulation. A word can be spoken or spelled, mispronounced or misspelled. It follows, it allows for variation in spelling and pronunciation across time and place. It is thus critical to distinguish words and their immediate tokenings from their articulations. Words cannot be obviously identified with shapes and so must be distinguished from their various articulations. So the first thing I said is that whatever a word is, it's not the same as its articulation, okay? So now I'm gonna offer a newest account. This is new, this is, not, this is not old, this is new. So I wanna claim that the primary triggers of offensive effects of tokens of slurs are neither the terms nor their meanings, not the words. So words, slurring words are not bad and slurring meanings are not bad, wherever they might be. It's slurring articulations which are bad. So rather some of their articulations. The articulations trigger offense because they are the carriers of those negative associations that arise through a history of usage. And because articulations evoke negative associations, contrapose to biblical revisionism, it is some of these articulations and not the words themselves that are the subject of the taboo. Notice for the example that, let's see if I can do this. This is gonna be one of these things where I cave in and do something stupid. Let's see if I can avoid, don't let me do anything stupid. Maybe it's too late, but anyway. You may all know about this debate in Maryland from a long time ago now, like 30 years ago, where uh, a white speaker who's working for the budget committee or something to that effect is talking to a mostly black audience, and he says that they have to, he uses an adverb, which the, for the non-L-O-Y non part is identical to the N-word, and then it ends in L-Y. Now, there's no etymological connection between those two words. The word, the, the adverb means cheap, basically you know, be, be very moderate in your expenses. But he chose that word, and the, and the uh, audience took umbrage. And what's interesting is, you know, of course, all the, most of the white commentators said, well, what's wrong with these people? They don't, know any, they don't know anything about etymology. If they didn't know the etymology, they wouldn't be offended. Whereas a lot of the black opinion writers said, let's see, there are 32 synonyms in the English language. This is for that word. Why did he choose this word, talking to a black audience? What was he thinking? He should have known better. So what's interesting is, I had dinner with someone last night who was a friend of mine who lives in London, and he was trying to explain to his daughters, who were 15, uh, this incident. And I'm not sure whether he believes what I believe about it, but here's a curious fact. When he got to the word, he looked around. This is the adverb, which means cheap. He looked around the room, and then he very qu the decibels dropped. So, you know, he, he said, blah, 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 L-Y, Lee. Fascinating. Same thing happened to me one time in, in Northwestern. I gave a talk in Northwestern to a large cognitive science community. And the chair of, uh, I can't remember now, chair of Puerto Rican studies, chair of black studies, and the LGBT chair, all there, and they were arguing that they could, in their classroom, they could use whatever slur term they wanted. This is when I said, you can't use these slur terms. You can't even mention them. They, they were denying that part of my paper. This is a while ago. And they said, we could, for example, I often say, and there's 100 people at least, maybe 200 people, and funny thing, I had to point out to them later, if I wish I had it on tape, when they got to the slur term that they use all the time in their classroom, their voice dropped about 80%, because they didn't know these people. They didn't know who was in the room with them. And it's interesting. It was fascinating. They, they were not even aware that they were censoring themselves. Similarly, my friend at dinner last night was censoring himself. This word, he knows the etymology. He knows exactly what's going on. But the word has become tainted. Don't use it. Now, notice that the, it's not the word. It's, it's the sound, right? It's, it's the overlap in, a, in articulation that's offensive. So that articulation is a bad articulation. Anything that's close to it is a bad articulation. Notice, by the way, if you try to, what's a balderize or whatever, the slur term with the, with the familiar uh, activity of asterisk, you gotta be careful. You can't just take the N word and cross out the I, you know, put a star over I. That's not gonna fly. That's gonna be a bad articulation. It's, it's too close to the original. It's an interesting question. I don't know who has the answer. The philosophers don't have the answers. How many asterisks do you need? You know, where do they have to go? You can't put asterisks across the whole word. What, what, what's that? Sometimes you see that in comic books. You don't know what the hell what's going on. So it's easy to conflate articulation with words. Why is that? Well, here's a, a well-known fact, right? You can't use a word without articulating it. So every time the word occurs, an articulation of the word will occur with it. 
So they're in, inextricably intertwined in a certain way. How do you separate them? What kind of test can you use? It? So I'm claiming that it's not the word that's offensive, it's the articulation that's offensive. And you say, well, that's crazy. Because they, how would you even prove that? Because they, they're inseparable. Well, they're not inseparable. Think of homophones. My guess is that if, if you have a homophone, which is innocent, right, but it's articulated in the canonical way that a slur term is, that's bad. If you drop that homophonic word on your audience, it's going to be bad. There's lots of cases. I should have put more cases up, perhaps, but the next time I give a talk. But here's an example from a guy at USC who got fired. So he's teaching Mandarin Chinese, and he's teaching it to business students. And, he's, and, they, and the question was, what do they use for a kind of filler word in Mandarin? So in English, we say, ah, 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 ah. What do they do in Chinese? He said, oh, they use the third person demonstrative. It, they use the third, the third plural, the it, they use it. And that's pronounced, and it's pronounced identical to the N word. And he repeated it over and over again. And he got fired. Now, you might think that was harsh, but you, know, you wonder, like, what would it have been like if I were there? Like, how many times did he repeat it? Why did he repeat it that many times? So, oh, this guy's issues play a role. Or what was the tone? Which was, was he amused? Was he enjoying it? Was it purely academic? In some sense, it may not matter. What matters is that he chose it. Now, by the way, there's no, let's bring Tim Williamson back onto the table. There's no possibility of a use mention of engineer. He said, I'm now going to speak Chinese. I'm going to use the word in Chinese. It's not English, it's Chinese. So there's no question of use mention. It was just another word from another language. But it happened to be pronounced the same way that a certain word, a slur term in our language is used. And therefore, it's prohibited, so to speak. Uh, it's impossible to talk about what I'll talk about. All right, actually, it's fine. But then why take articulations rather than words to trigger offensive events? Short answer. The effect tends to persist whenever the canonical articulation of a slur is present, even if no slur is tokened. And conversely, the slur loses its potency when its articulation is sufficiently far off from the articulation. So I gave you an example of, of uh, the word not being present. It speaks Chinese. So you speak Chinese. Here's an even better example. In Chinese and Mandarin, there are certain written words that are highly offensive, but not spoken. If you speak the words, no one's bothered by them. But if you write them, so that's, that's got to be articulation, right? Because it's the same word. You're speaking the word and you're writing the word. When you write the word, you do something bad. When you speak the word, you do something OK. So it can't be the word that's shot on you. It's the articulation. It's another kind of example. So homophones. I told you this example about the demonstrative. Uh, you can't explain this by semantics. Or etymology, because the speaker announced in advance exactly which word he was to be a token and what the word means in Mandarin. He gave it a specific meaning and he gave it a specific tokening. So no slur was tokened in this case. The word token only accidentally matches an articulation of slur, and yet it was offensive. Same thing, I could say the same thing about the Latin word, I mean about the adverb, right? It just, it just happens to share an articulation. There's nothing else they have in common. They don't have any meaning in common. The word's not there. It's not, you know, parts of words are not words. Second point. Now this, I think this is maybe the only, you might not agree with anything I said tonight, but from my perspective, the one thing I'm going to say that I think might be, might be controversial, I have to think it through further, is this next point. So I want to claim that, well, first of all, I'm going to start off with saying something which I think is uncontro uncontroversial. I think it's possible to mispronounce a word. I think it's possible to misspell a word. So that, we know what word you're tr you were trying to spell correctly, and you spelled it incorrectly. But we know the word. I mean, same thing, it doesn't, it's not pronounced that way, it's pronounced this way. Those are things we say all the time. We don't think we're taking the, we don't, the, the, if we think it's another word, it hasn't been mispronounced, right? That's the correct pronunciation for that other word. So when we say you've mispronounced the word, we mean that you've tokened a word with a bad pronunciation, or you spelled a word with a wrong spelling. So for example, those who, who read British, books in America think you guys are misspelling words all the time. They think, what's going on here? In fact, I always puzzle when my American students are using British spellings. I think, well, are they British? Do they study in England for a while? What's going on here? Now, you could just say, like my colleague Paul Petrosky, who's one of these Chomsky and I language people, they're different languages. But you're going to have a lot of languages. And you have to explain why, they can, why we're so good at sharing. A language I never studied, your language, your I language. You know, I'm really good at talking to you. And Paul said, well, there's a lot of overlap. I said, yeah, that's what we call language, the overlap. 
So if one's attention to a slur is so far off it's not recognizable that the slur was uttered, the offense effect will not be registered, triggered. While we might be upset or outraged if we were, that the speaker was tokening, we won't experience the same sort of palpable offensive effect we would have had if the attention should have been more successful. So the point I'm making there is that I'm not saying that if you mispronounce a slur term, you're home free. I mean, someone might say, do you realize what he was saying? You know, well, no, what was he saying? He was saying that, oh, that bastard, I can't believe he said that out loud. And you, you, know, you get really angry. But that's a different, that's downstream. That's not this thing that's like punch in the face. So when you mispronounce a word, you don't punch the person in the face, but you still have, you still have pronounced it, all right? So if it was the word, it shouldn't matter whether you mispronounced it or not. Uh, shifting articulations. I talked about this example already. So you might think, here's a misreading of me, or mishearing. You might think I'm saying, oh, it's all about sound, that it sounds are bad. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that sounds, associations are created by the articulations, but the associations are what makes the word, what makes the sound bad. The reason why little kids like to play, think about children. They like to play these games where they get to trick you into saying something. It looks like you're saying something. You know, my kids done it to me for years. You just say, well, what's the name of the street we're on? Say it three times fast. He said, ah, you can't believe you said that word. So, uh, for example. So in other words, he's trying to get me to make a certain pronunciation. He, he knows I'm not going to token the word. I'm tokening something else, but it sounds like a bad word. Okay? So the sound is what the association attaches to. So whenever we hear that sound later on, and by the way, as, as terms fade or, or rich, the sound doesn't change. And I'm done. <laughs> oh my god. I'm so happy to be done. OK. <laughs> Thank you all very much for putting up on me. How do you get the articulation in a slur word? Where did it come from, you mean? Well, how, how do you do it? It's a skill, isn't it? I mean, if you read Roger Kipling, for example, uh, yeah. very few people do nowadays, I ask. But, um, you know, he's got... I see. That's a good question, I think. I think. Soldiers and so on and so on. Yeah. There are plenty of slur words yeah. there. Well, we, usually, well, you just, you just gave me an answer, right? Because you said... You can read them, so you can see the word. You can read the bad word, you know how, but you don't know how it sounds. That's your, like Latin, for example. You might have guesses about how Latin sounds. You might have educated guesses about how Latin sounds. So it means that the, it's hard to slur somebody with Latin if you're speaking. But if you're writing, it's easy. They're all over the place. The, the Romans were very... One of the things I'm fascinated by is uh, some languages that are chock full of profanities have very few slur terms, like Italian. Take Italian, for example. You know, they, they, the things they come out of their mouth, literally translated, are like, you think they're going to go to jail for that, what they call their children sometimes. Um, but if you ask them about slur terms, they have like a handful. I asked these two Italian guys who were at some conference I was at recently, I said, why is that? He said, no immigrants. <laughs> So in other words, their bad behavior about immigration has led to good behavior about slurring. I guess that's some small recompense, but I don't know, not enough. So the answer to your question is, I have to be presented with a slur term in, in some articulation. And, yeah, and usually it's written if I can't, you know, if you read. I read, I read um, The Call of the Wild with my son when he was about 10. He never let me read again with him. He said, that's it. I'm done with you. Because there were so many words that were like eight syllables long. and. There are words I didn't know how to pronounce. I'd never seen them before. I'd never seen them again. Uh, so there are lots of words I don't know how to pronounce, but I can recognize the word. If I know what it means, you know, I might not know what it means as a slur term. By the way, my, my question, you might, ask my, you might ask me, are you denying that slur terms have meanings? No, of course they have meanings. They're identical in meaning to the counterparts. So the meaning of a slur term is identical to the meaning of its counterpart. So it's not meaning driving the force. It's something else altogether different, so I claim. Uh, there are, by the way, the, probably the most influential American philosopher who died recently, Saul Kripke, 
if you think about his views about naming and so on, if you think of these slur terms as names of groups, uh, what I just said would be obviously true. I hadn't thought about that until relatively recently. So there's a philosophical underpinning for this view as well, that the meanings are identical. It's something else different about them. What I'm claiming is what's different about them is their associations attached to their uh, articulations. I think, I don't know, I think who's next? Hey. I've never thought about slur in terms before your lecture, and I'm very surprised to hear that there is a whole community thinking about slur terms. Lots. Uh, yeah, so I, I've been missing a lot, I think. But, well, I don't uh, know about that part, but. The first, uh, the first observation that they're not behaving normally, let's say, yeah. uh, in a truth functional way yeah. is, is definitely setting them apart, even though I don't think we should have any hope to sort of single out slur terms as a particular identifiable category in the language, right? right? Uh, but I, I started wondering, um, can we conditionally slur? So put the slur term in a phrase in the consequent of a conditional? And I think we cannot do that in general unless the antecedent contains some information about a reason or rationale or whatever you might want to call it. To give you the give the, to use the slur term probably as referring to the or applying I should say to the uh, hearer. Okay. Is that uh, Let me compatible try. with the way you with the way you look at it? I'm trying to figure. I have a date I'm going to give you. But I'm trying to figure out how to give it to you without winding up in jail or something. Um, if I say to you, um, if someone is uh, uh, inferior on virtue on account of being black. Right, I have that in the antecedent. Then he's an N-word. Okay, you don't think that's bad? I, I don't recommend you do that. <laughs> but that, there's an N-word in the consequent, right? The information in the antecedent, which usually for like uh, for presupposition, for example, is a way of canceling the presupposition. So if I have the meaning, if I say, look, if John used to smoke, then he has stopped, right? That doesn't commit me to John used to smoke, right? Because so the same thing you might think of a slur term as this presuppositional content. I don't know what it is. No one ever tells me. But assume it's X. So if, if X is the case for black members of the black community, then John is an N. That's bad. So the very thing that you were suggesting we could do, we can't do for slur terms. So I disagree with you about the slur. Slur terms are bad no matter where they occur. There's no happy place for a slur term. There's no, if you go into a, you know, a, a white uh, supremacist meeting in Alabama or something like that. I recommend that you don't use any slur terms ever. Yeah. Briefly, can you have a prohibitionism that is contextual to each particular language? So I know your argument was arguing against prohibitionism. It seemed to be like across the board. Yeah. Perhaps prohibitionism works for there's prohibitionism subscript English or US English a prohibitionism subscript uh, Mandarin Chinese that helps to explain all the things you're talking about right. and yet seems to avoid moving into the articulation aspect at the very end of your talk. What's interesting what you're saying is that I think that's how I defend articulation. So one of the things I'm worried about is that I can't tell you, so one of the things I'm worried about is that I can't tell you how an articulation, how much of an articulation has to overlap with a slur term for, for it to become inherit the bad things. And my answer, tentatively so far, has been it's context sensitive. That's why I was saying philosophers can't answer it. Usually, when philosophers say it's context sensitive, it means like I don't have a clue on how to do this. You know, I don't. Know. It's just context. It's all about context. So I do, I do that for articulation. So when I ask you, if you ask me, you know, does it have to have three letters in common, or four, or five? Does it matter what the letters are? Could it? I don't have an answer to that question. I, I'm going to defend this by saying I shouldn't. That's not a philosophical question. So maybe it's a linguistic question or some, some other psychological, psychological question, it looks like. Uh, but then it's going to vary. You know, you're not going to get an answer. You're not going to get an algorithm, right? You're not gonna, because it's going to vary from context to context, which means I don't know how to do it. Uh, now, I don't see why you said that about prohibition. Now, how would that help? How would contextualizing the languages help with the prohibitionist? My arguments against prohibitionism. So the standard argument against prohibitionism is I got it backwards. Words aren't prohibited first and then become offensive later. They're, they're prohibited because they be, became offensive. That's why they're prohibited. That's the view that I have to respond to. And you thought you were going to help 
the prohibitionists. I'm, if you want to help me, I'm, I'm more than welcome to take the help. <laughs> Bring it on. So tell me, how does the contextualizing help, though? I wasn't sure if I followed that part. So you were saying that you're going to contextualize prohibition to English, American English, British English, French, German, and so on. One thing that I was thinking about um, was that with respect to the examples you gave against prohibitionism, yeah. where that it, it had been banned from the empire, yeah. but that seems to be more of a top-down banning rather than the examples that you mentioned earlier about people who were like, no, no, the reason why this is banned or this, is, or this doesn't apply is because these terms were foisted onto us and we didn't choose these terms. Mm -hmm. So perhaps there's a, not only is there a I contextualism see. for prohibitionism with respect to each language, but there's also this, this sociolinguistic, uh, mm -hmm. or this is a just so story, but mm -hmm. sociolinguistically, part of the reason why it's banned is because these terms are being foisted on a top-down manner onto people who are being pressed or denigrated mm -hmm. who don't have an active role in choosing these words for themselves. That's very good. I think that's interesting. In fact, uh, it might explain something. One of the problems I've been having recently is there are lots of terms which I applaud that I never thought of as slur terms, which the people who are in the target group are now declaring them slur terms. So for example, white supremacists don't want to be called Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, I apologize to all the white supremacists. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but that's the kind of thing you have in mind. Each group gets to decide. I, mean, I, have to, I have to run through all the ones I can think of and see if that applies, but it's a good start. So you know, it's reduce the entire debate to about self-determination. Every single slur term originally was, not my, my other reasons why it stays, it stays around as long as it has, um, but originally uh, it, was, it was introduced in a maybe a harmless way, it wasn't meant to be harmful, and then issues about self-determination take over. I have to think about that. That's worth thinking about. The lady on the aisle over on that side of the room first, please. I have to first have to see you. I don't know why that would help, but <laughs> anyway. Okay, go ahead and ask your question again. Are you an interactionist or an innatist? Uh, what's an interactionist exactly? Interactionist is 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 basically an op opposite view. Um, of nativism? Um, I don't think I said anything about nativism, though. Did I say, you said is it nativism, is that what you meant, like innate? I'm, I'm referring to uh, uh, this innatist model by Chomsky and, uh, oh, and his counter. Oh, uh, gee, I don't know enough about that to say. That language is innate or interaction uh, I see. based. Is um, language or words I don't think he thinks lex interaction? Does he think lexicon's innate? I don't think he thinks that's innate. I think he thinks that's learned, the lexicon. Mm -hmm. So. He might be a nativist about all sorts of rules and constraints on rules and things of that sort, but I don't think he's a nativist about our, our lexicography. I could be wrong about that, though. I think about that. But it seems like you're an interactionist uh, with your um, idea of articulation or context. Uh, well, so so are you that, saying I... meaning is context dependent? Is it interpersonal or it's, uh, it's subjective? Is meaning subjective? Oh, no, no, I don't want that. I want meaning, to, to me, one of the things that I find offensive about a lot of this literature is they start saying things like meaning is indeterminate. I think that sounds like a contradiction. You know, for me, meanings are about sharing content, right? I mean, the reason the meaning, we, we, that's what we share when we speak to each other, we're sharing content. So meaning is not subjective, it's supposed to be objective. Yes, so you're not an innateist. But I'm not an innateist in that so. respect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, at the back, on the same side. If we had a complete prohibition on slurring, in your opinion, would that signal the end of comedy? Mm, good question. Uh, it wouldn't it's certainly not signal the end of xenophobia, right? Xenophobia can take place in your own head. You don't need to, you need to say it out loud to, to participate with comedy. Um, I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> I like comedy. <laughs> So I hope not, but I see what you're getting at, I think. I think it's interesting. I think it's a, a fascinating dichotomy when in public, many people wouldn't use the language that they would accept and laugh at in a comedy show. That's true. That's true. Oh, that's, of course, not true everywhere. You said many people, not all. I mean, it's many people like to use these words every chance they get, anywhere they can. 
Thanks very much for the talk. Um, I just had a question about, it seems Wait, like, is that, sorry, okay. uh, the, the account that you have seems to want to um, cohere with what people would generally take to be an offensive use of slur. For example, getting rid of the use, uh, not acknowledging a difference in offense between use Keep and Keep the mention. microphone a little closer. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, and I wondered what implications that has uh, for lots of communities where use of a slur, it varies between communities, isn't seen as offensive when it's meant to refer to the group who are using it or has a history of referring to that group. Um, so yeah, it was mainly just wondering uh, how an articulation account can make sense of or a waving of the taboo on a use of a slur within the community that it was originally intended to refer to. I act. think almost all slur terms, almost all, not all, but many started off as neutral, you know, harmless, innocent. And then some associations got created. Now, he was suggesting that it has to do with self-determination. That's interesting, I have to think about that. I don't know if that generalizes across the board. But I don't, it's, there are slur terms that are created, that are intended to be nasty from the get-go. But that doesn't happen all the time. In fact, most of the time, I don't think it happens. So, so in other words, was your question, how does a slur term which starts off in an innocent life be? I think, I, I, I think maybe you just, sorry, couldn't hear. Um, it's not your fault, I just it, No, hear. it was just on, um, so for, yeah, for example, a given community, there's a slur term directed towards them. It's not seen as offensive when you, members of that community use it to refer to one another. Um, why in an, how can an articulation account make sense of there being no offense because the same sounds are coming out, the same articulation is occurring, but it's speaker dependent, the offense seems to me to be. Well, I was claiming it was the associations that rendered the articulation nasty or not. So associations happen across time, and they also require salience of certain sort. So certain things, certain events occurring, let's suppose you associate with the, uh, that articulation, and depending on how painful or unpainful you find those associations, you will think the term is, should be not used or used, should be uh, prohibited or not. Is that, I'm not sure I'm hearing you. It's not your fault can, though. Can, can, can I have a go? Can you tell me if I'm putting words into your mouth? Oh, good. Let's con consider the case where there's a certain term, yeah. which is a slur if it's ah. used by a non-community member against that community. Oh, good question. But where the community themselves against whom it's targeted yeah. use that about themselves yeah. and they're fine with using yeah. it internally to yeah. the community. I got, I got, can the articulation theory make sense of that? Yeah, I got lots of answers why for is, that. Why is the use of it by the community itself? Got a whole chapter on that. That's, that's the okay, so-called. That's the brief summary of what. That's the reclamation problem. Reclamation. So first of all, you realize a lot of people reject reclamation. So oddly enough, some of them make sense. Like so, for example, uh, um, some of the older. Uh, I'm trying to think of the names of people. I can remember, but older black members of the black community never bought into this whole idea of using the, the word, the N word, as a form of camaraderie. They thought it was just offensive, no matter who you use it. So that was sort of fascinating to me. There was an age thing going on there. The older they were, the more they rejected the idea that this term could be reclaimed or appropriated to be used as a kind of camaraderie, like we're common. So your question is, two questions, I guess. But the main question might be, how does the term get reclaimed? If I give you how a term gets reclaimed, then I'll tell you how articulation got reclaimed as well. Uh, that's a good question. And the answer is, nobody, nobody really has a good. One of the problems that the standard view among meaning theorists, right, think about how crazy this is, is it's ambiguity. The standard view is ambiguity. So there are two words in English. There's the bad one that we use, and there's the good one that the members of this group use. They talk about themselves. That view seems insane, because that makes, you know, bank is ambiguous, and the two meanings have nothing to do with each other. They come from different languages. They come from very different paths. So usually ambiguity is thought to, Lexical ambiguity is thought to be an accident, so to speak. But certainly not an accident that the reclaimed word is identical to the word that was offensive. So that's a problem, right? You have to think, how am I going to solve that problem? And I don't know how to solve that problem exactly. But I don't think it's peculiar. I think it's everybody's problem. It's one of these things where I don't think anybody has a solution to that problem. Uh, on the articulation account, um, I see. You see that it's the same problem for 
the meeting account, right? Because you don't want to say ambiguity. And I, don't want, I can't say different articulations. So I need a special story. One of the things I did say in the past, which I thought was cute, I don't know if it's correct, is that uh, they're like uh, sanctions. You know, like when, I, when we sanction Iran, let's say, or something like that. We didn't sanction, we didn't prohibit medicine coming in. We didn't prohibit things for children that were going to make children's lives better, food and things of that sort. So there are these escape clauses on prohibitions. That's cute. I don't know how insightful it is. But it was a way out. I mean, you know, philosophers are basically trying to find a way out most of the time. <laughs> um, so I think that would answer your question, but it's not satisfying. So I don't have a satisfactory answer yet. I'm working on it. OK. There were a couple of questions, I think, in the front, finally, yeah? OK. Um, thank you. Um, that was really insightful. Um, I remain largely convinced, I would say. Um, but my question was, like, you mentioned passingly that there was this slur, I cannot remember the language, that was offensive when written, but not when spoken out loud. Mandarin. Mandarin. So, um, and then it's a general feature of what's so-called lexicographic languages. Languages that the writings, the, the written form is not syllabic or alphabet. It's not based on, you can't, you can't infer what it's going to sound like from reading the words. So when you learn Mandarin, you learn two languages, the written, word, the written language and the spoken language. OK. So my this half answers my question, I guess. Um, so like in this sense, there's like this language accounts for two different types of articulations. One of them is written, one of them is spoken. Right. OK, so this would not work so much in English or in no. other languages that don't have. No. Uh, I have any examples. I have homophones in English. Um, is there any example of where the spoken version is offensive but the written version isn't? Not that I can think of. Can think of. One of the problems, of course, is that some written forms can be pronounced in lots of different ways. And they mean different things depending on how they're pronounced. That's why they're called homophones, I suppose. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Good try, though. Yeah, OK. That, that sort of answers. OK. Thanks for the talk. Um, uh, so I guess towards the end, if, if I'm understanding right, you're saying that the force of a slur term sort of comes from um, the associations like its articulation would yeah. have. Uh, I guess I'm having a little difficulty trying to understand how the associations that an articulation has is you know, different from the meaning the term has. Not completely independent. So think of associations as like tone in Frege's sense. You know, tone is not part of meaning. It's not shared. So let's start off with simple cases. So when I see grass, I think of my, mo my mother rolling me in the grass. That's not you thinking. You have different associations, let's suppose. But some of our associations are common. We sometimes refer to them as stereotypes or prototypes or something like that. Uh, we have certain beliefs that we have. We see certain statistical generalities that we embrace and so on and that fact. So none of that's about meaning. Why not? Well, because meanings have certain properties, and these things don't have those properties. So meanings compose, for example. You could take two meanings for, for words and put them together to get a meaning or an expression. You can't take two different stereotypes and put them together to get a third stereotype. Fuller and I wrote a, Jerry Fuller and I wrote a famous paper on this called The Pet Fish. So think of your stereotype, the red herring and the pet fish. Think of your stereotype of a pet. It might be a dog or a cat. We think your stereotype of a fish. It might be a trout. I don't know. I don't, I don't have any. But you put them together, what's your stereotype of a pet fish? Well, it's going to be a guppy or something like that. But you can't get guppy out of dog and, and trout. You know? So that's the kind of way of saying that whatever these things, associations are, they don't blend like meanings blend. They don't compose. So I don't care about the, the meaning parts off the table. So associations are just like these connections, psychological connections. When I hear the word, right, when I hear an articulation, what do I, uh, what do I uh, think of? What comes to mind? My view, when I hear the word dog, I think of dogs. Okay, that's a semantic connection. But it might be fuzzy things or something like that. So I remember my dog, I, I never had a dog. But if I had a dog, it would have been fuzzy, let's imagine. Okay. Um, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, but it is because of like the shared associations that you know, we find a slur offensive. Right? That's what stereotypes are, right? Shared associations. And sometimes the associations are not so bad. They're just common, you know, they're just, I remember one of my teachers from graduate school, Paul Emil, a psychologist, said, you know, behind, there's a lot of truth in a lot of stereotypes. Don't think they're all bad. And I said, OK, uh, don't tell me. I'm not, gonna, I'm not listening. 
Um, yeah, they don't have to be bad. Usually they get bad when they, people talk about what causes them. Like, why is there this connection? Oh, because they're inherently this or something like that. that. That's when it gets bad. OK. Did, did you have a question? Uh, yes. But, uh, Don't you think uh, that uh, an, a very easy way and perhaps uh, a quite an efficient way to slur a person is to address him or her by a name which is different from their preferred style of self-designation. Uh, for example, somebody calls, prefers to call himself Robert, and I deliberately address him as Bob. Yeah. Well, oh, oh, the opposite would be also true. Uh, he prefers to call himself Bob in quite an yeah. informal way. And I, on the other hand, uh, uh, sternly look into his eyes and, and say, Robert. And that, that he would feel ill at ease. Uh, yeah. what, 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 what do you reckon? How, if, if you agree with me, how does it fit into I your theory? I agree with you 100%. But it doesn't, it's not pertinent to what I want to do. Why not? Because I want to distinguish slur words from slurring. So I can slur people by saying, I don't want you hanging out with those people. You know, those people over there, that side of the room. Stay away from that, those people. It's a kind of a slurring. There's no, it doesn't mean those people is a slur term. That's their terms I already define as names of groups, you know, target groups, and so on. Uh, I have a collaborator I wrote a book with named Matthew Stone, and he goes nutty when people call him Matt. Don't ever call him Matt. He freaks out when he calls him Matt. But that doesn't make his name a slur term or the, the diminution of the slur term. So I want to distinguish between slurring and slur terms. And slur terms are names of groups that are objects of scorn or something to that effect. Whereas uh, a slurring, that's, I think it's, it's another one of these areas which is shocking to find out is how little, how little is written on it. Like, what exactly is the intonation? So I was telling him before that we got started about how in philosophy, in the, in the 70s, Kripke wrote this, Saul Kripke wrote this famous paper about uh, speaker, speaker reference and semantic reference in which he embraced H.P. Grice. Grice had been sort of persona non gratis and among analytic philosophers because he didn't do modal logic or something. Who knows why? And then all of a sudden Kripke said, no, he's kosher. It's fine. You can read him. And what moved Kripke were these scalar implicatures. It's implicatures like, well, you say, I just saw the guy pull a red handkerchief out of his hat. And you said, well, it looked red. And Kripke says, you know, normally that's considered a challenge, you know, a disagreement. You're, you're shading the guy. Right? He says, I saw it red when he said, well, it looked red. Meaning you didn't see it red. Okay. <clears throat> now, Grice and Kripke bond over this example and say, this refers to a deep psychological, anthropological, psychological fact about human beings. When you follow a strong statement with a weaker statement, you're casting doubt on the strongest statement. Bullshit. It's a Grafengian of English. Well, it looked red. That intonation pattern means I disagree. Notice if you said, he didn't pull a red handkerchief. I said, well, it looked red. I'm still disagreeing with you. Notice if I said, yeah, it looked red. I'm agreeing with you. So in other words, there's an English convention which does not exist in Italian or French or German. They have different conventions in different languages. And that convention says that this intonation pattern uh, means such and such arbitrarily. Now, what I'd like to see happen, which has never happened, is someone to take a look at these so-called slurring cases, not slurred words, but ex examples of the verb slurring, and see, is there any commonalities? Is there anything we could say in general about why when I say, don't, I don't want you dating those people, right? Why that's considered, a, you know, in some sense, insult, to those, a diminution of those people, a slurring of those people. So we do talk about slurring independently of slurs. And I don't know, I like the fact that, I mean, I, I don't like it, it's just there. I mean, I don't deny that it exists, but I don't know why, I don't know what the rules are. There's also other kinds of examples, like, for example, if I say, has the Serb come yet? There's something about shortening these words that's considered offensive. The Croat, the Serb, you know. Why, I don't know. The Brit, maybe not the Brit. Oh, the Brit sounds like I can't think of that. Maybe in America that sounds. We've got a question in the front row on the other side now. I was wondering what, uh, so you, you have like the sting that you feel is really important. Is the, does the uh, articulationist account rely on that affective response from a kind of large subset of the population, and then if we, if we, you know, 
if it does, can you kind of empirically, you know, put it out to 10,000 people and you have some so barrier where there's is, enough? How many people have to recognize this? Um, to, what ex to what extent is the feeling component constitutive of the articulationist success to say that is a slur term? Yeah. So one of the things that's amusing to me about this literature, and I mean, I joined it late in the game. I didn't start writing it to the aughts, is nobody ever defines a slur term. There's no definition out there. So you might wonder, does that handicap you? Well, maybe, maybe not. So the question is, do I need it? Of course, you know, if you're, if you're a contemporary philosopher, or if you've been reading Plato and Socrates, you might think nobody ever has a definition of anything. So not surprising to have a definition of a slur term. So the question is, how important is it to be able to give explicit definition of a thing before you can actually talk about it and discuss it? Is that am I on track, or is that off? So the articulationist is the, kind of the acoustic right. thing put out into the world. Right. How important is the sting that's associated with the deployment of the term? Yeah. Sometimes, by the way, the sting, as I said, it fades, some fades, some stings fade, some sharpen. So I think that as the civil rights movement got stronger and stronger in the 60s, some of these words that were, had not been offensive or were a little offensive became way more offensive. Uh, I don't know why that is. Maybe because there's a larger group of people who were, who were worried about it. Maybe because it was more salient. The, the bad associations were more salient. We were seeing these images from Mississippi and places like that that we didn't like. Uh, so I don't know why. But that's, I, don't, I don't know if it's philosophical. That's my way out of these things. It's not, it's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's your problem. Let me um, try a question, then I'll come back to you. So you said at one point in the talk, Ernie, um, I think you said that your children used to try and get you to you know, say Child. some word very fast, and then yeah. you say a bad word. I'm not going to tell you what it so is. So I just wondered, there are many, many words, like the F word, for body parts, for sexual activities, for things that have scientific names, yeah. which it's not the done thing to say. You know, if you have to say it in court, quoting somebody else, you say, I do apologize, Your Honor, for having to yeah. use such a bad word, etc. Or Or you have euphemisms like the F word. But they're not slurs, because yeah, nobody right. thinks that those body parts or functions, they're not trying to say that they're bad in some right. way. Is it just an accidental feature of your account, I mean, are you, are you really giving an account of a linguistic phenomenon that straddles slurs and things like the F word? Or do you think that the phenomenon you're describing is, is that, that, that slurs are a sui generis phenomenon? We need no. some other kind of account First, of the F word. So the book is intended to be about all profanities, I mean, all pejorative expressions, including profanities. So one of the things I'm interested in is like, why is shit bad? You know, why, why is that a bad word? I mean, how could it be? It's not insulting to the object. You know, I mean, you know, we could say defecation. Oh, that's okay, but for some reason, there's this, the short version is bad. I don't, I don't know why. It's an interesting question. There might be, might not be an answer to it. But in terms of my general fact, one of the things that's fascinating to me is if you look at the ways which we try to get around uh, using the canonical articulations of, of profanities. Right? We say friggin'. Or sh Here's a question for you. I don't know the answer to this. Is shite a, a, a nice version of it? <laughs> or is it a... Depends what, what country you're in. If you're in Ireland, it's worse. But I'm wondering, is it, is, it a, is, it a, is, it a, is it like friggin'? Or like, uh, what's another one that we sometimes use? Shoot? We say shoot. You know? Oh, shoot. In Kansas, they say that, I guess. I'm not sure. <laughs> But I mean, is shite uh, actually a, a bad word, or is that the nice version? Is that the cleaned up version? You don't know? It's like you better learn. It's like 10% nicer. It's, what, it's like 10% nicer. OK. OK. <laughs> so that's an example I would have in mind, is that, so, because uh, you might think, that looks pretty close. You know, is that close enough to be bad? Uh, mm. Well, she gave an answer. The answer is yes. She said 10% nicer. So she's actually saying, that's not far enough. Go to shoot. You get to shoot, you're like, uh, what? What's that mean exactly? Friggin'? I never use that. Is that. Do people still use that word? I don't know if they even use it anymore. Uh, what's some other words that you can think of that, like nice versions of dirty words? <laughs> but, okay. The, 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 By the way, can I just want to say one more thing? Notice that when I say friggin', right, 
I'm not, I'm actually articulating the bad word in a nice way. It's like, it's, it's like the asterisk in a way. It's not like a different word altogether. I don't, it's just, it's a different pronunciation of the bad word. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a respectable pronunciation of the bad word. That's what, that's what I'm claiming. I'm sorry, go ahead. The, 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 so you say they're just the same phenomenon. So the badness of slurs, in your view, then can't have anything to do with the badness of the attitudes oh. being expressed by oh. the slurs. Uh, well, as I just said a moment ago, I don't understand why shit is a bad word. It's just, it's kind of puzzling how it became mm. a bad word because it's picking out the same thing defecation picks. They pick out exactly the same thing. What's a polite way of picking out? I don't know what that means, but it's polite. More polite to say defecation. Mm. I think it means that more, more of your audience will know, will know what you're talking about. Um, but um, I didn't say they were the same explanations were in play. What I was claiming is that the articulations, that might be a different story to explain why the articulations of the, the non slur terms became offensive and so on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the, what I want to claim is the articulations. And if you look at the behavior of when you're trying to clean up your profanities, it's a lot like trying to find you know, nice ways of saying bad words, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. disguising bad words with nice ways. I agree. And with what that. I don't know the answer to is what counts as a disguise. Mm. Like, how is it, is it, can you count it? It doesn't look like it counts the number of letters. I don't know how to answer that question. But I know when I see one, I know it's sort of wild, because I, when, I, when I'm confronted with one, I realize it's a nice version of a bad word. OK, thank you. Yes, um, in the front. Thank you so much for taking a follow-up question. So my question on the possibility to, uh, to have slurs in a consequent of a conditional yeah. was meant to push for the view that, of course, it's the performative for force that we have to get a better grip on. Right. Right. Now, um, I still think, uh, you know, an example, despite your warning, uh, like, uh, if you eat this whole bag of French fries in one fell swoop, then you're a pig, right? Where a pig is a very <laughs> normal word, but it can be used as a slur in this particular phrase, right? It's a very clear slur, whereas, say, another nonsensical conditional, like if two and two is five, then you're a pig, I would just sort of laugh, right? That I wouldn't have any kind of... Uh, what was the phrase, the, the stinging effect of a slur, to me at least. I right? see. But in general, if we look at uh, the more pragmatic effects, apart from all the power and community and social linguistic aspects of it, right, there are performatives that we cannot escape from. Like, I pronounce you married, or I pronounce you man and wife, it's not something you can say, oh, sorry, you made a mistake or something, right? right? Or it's not true, or right? it, 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 it happens. And if, it, if you're the victims, right. you cannot say right. that, you know, you cannot escape from it, I would say, yeah. right? But from a lot of offenses, even if they are intended as offenses, we can escape. And my view of offenses has always been that an offense only works if it's accepted as such, right? So a promise, like, I promise you a rose garden can be just something sweet you say, right? And everybody recognizes that you're not in a position to promise a rose garden, and hence it doesn't really have the effect of yeah. a promise, it just has the effect of having said yeah. something sweet, yeah. right? Um, it, it, similarly, uh, you can have offenses that are sort of ignored or you know, you can shrug your shoulders or be indifferent or just say, well, he's just playing a, his, uh, you know his uh, po favorite power game, or right, but you right. don't necessarily have to ac accept an offense, right. right? So performatives differ in in that kind of behavior and right. differ significantly. So I still think that the slur that doesn't work as a slur if it can be, uh, let's say, ignored or shrugged off or right. you know discarded, right. whatever. Right. What is your view on that? Well, the first thing I want to tell you, a phenomenon that philosophers, how philosophers ruin topics. So philosophers didn't, were, as I said, I found this one paper from the 80s, I think, by Jennifer. Otherwise, I didn't find anything. I looked hard. The ones I did find were by logicians using slur terms to make a logical point. Uh, but then all of a sudden, maybe me, maybe a few other people wrote some papers. And then what happens every time, the philosophers swarm in. 
it's like they're like advertising agents or something. They think, let's see, what are the niches that haven't been filled yet? You know? And before you know it, within a couple of years, every possible position has been explored and defended and changed and added on, something like that. So those views I gave you, I, had, I think I had a list of six, but it's really a disguise of like 100 views. Believe it or not, there are performative accounts of slurring. So yeah. there are published yeah. yeah. So it's not, you're not the first. That's a, um, 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 do I think? Now, what was the question? The question is, oh, the problem with, the, with your suggestion, I think, it was brought out by that original paper I read by Janet Hornsby, which is that if you think you can blow him off by remaining silent, so to speak, ignoring him, that the problem with that view, which she argues, and I think she's convincingly right, is that it sort of has a feeling of complicity. Like if you're in a room, that's what's so awful about these words. If you're in, I'll give you an example. So I was in a room with a bunch of a faculty, and, and, and Lavelle, the graduate, who was an undergraduate student. And one of my colleagues, who is no longer my colleague, thank God, <laughs> came over and he said, well, a white guy, by the way, that's an important part of the story. He comes and he said, hey, Ann, what's happening? And we, all the rest of us, like, we all backed up like three steps, like, I don't know this, I'm not part of this thing like that. And then he finally left, and Lavelle said, that guy's an asshole. And uh, he was right. Uh, but uh, the fact is that we didn't say anything. You know, we should have said something right then and there. There's always a fear that if you don't say anything, it's interpreted as, and that's what's going on, right? You might think it's too sophisticated for, for xenophobes to think this way, but I think even if it's only implicit, the pressure is to see how much you get away with so that it becomes backgrounded, so that this usage of these terms become acceptable. So that's the, that's the goal, so, so to speak. Uh, so I'm not sure that igno ignoring it uh, helps. Because you were suggesting that, you know, the other one that I think we're getting close to is the Lenny Bruce account, right? Lenny Bruce thought that in the 50s, that if we just all could get out and just say the N word thousands of times and words against Jewish people, words against women, and so on, somehow they would lose their significance. It doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, they don't, they don't die, they don't change and die easily. These words are around for a long, good reasons, and just repeating them isn't gonna. So that's not a good response either. But I'm not sure that the. Ignoring them helps because it might just empower them. If, if by ignoring you mean don't respond. Good. Well, um, clearly there's a lot more to say about this, oh. but um, I think we're timed out for the evening. So okay. thank you very much, all of you, for your contributions. Let's thank Ernie very much for that talk. Thank you. Thank you.